Hello, everybody. Hello. And welcome. <laughs> My, I was having a <laughs> UI problem for a second there. Uh, <laughs> and welcome to episode 23 of Mask and Mimicry, tabletop role-playing podcast. Today's topic is being a good player. Mm. Velik, not yet. I know, that's hard to believe. But <laughs> I'm definitely going to do it. Just uh, try to moderate slightly. As always... I'm Velik. This is Brand. Yeah. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna ramble on about tabletop. Ask some questions. Hopefully, get some feedback, some questions, and some some opinions from you as well. And uh, today's topic was kind of random. Um, we weren't really planning on talk, talking about it. It wasn't in our schedule. You know, I mean, we don't really have a firm schedule anyway. But it wasn't in our topic wasn't on list. The list. Yeah. Um, but it was more of a random thing of you know there's a lot of there's a lot of pressure on gms on game masters for every game for the success of the game uh and for the game to be good and enjoyable for everybody uh but really you know the success of the game is as much if not more on the players you know and a lot of people talk about this uh, talk about the mercer effect for Critical Role. Mm-hmm. We're, pro- we're probably going to talk about Critical Role a little bit, as we sometimes do, because we're both fans. Um, yes. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of people talk about the Mercer effect, and it's, it's a real thing, um, where, uh, you know, people watch Critical Role and other live-streamed tabletop games, and they see how, you know, in some ways, the pinnacle of how awesome some of these tabletop games can be. And then they mm-hmm. expect that from amateur GMs uh, yeah. to be able to produce this. And I was thinking about this the other day, and I was like, you know, it's kind of it's it's also kind of not just unfair, but it's kind of unrealistic because a lot of this also comes from the players. Because uh, I was specifically thinking about Critical Role and how C- I watch CR every week. Matt Mercer is an amazing dungeon master but if it were not for his players being really good players i wouldn't watch it every week you know there's a lot of different things um and i don't really have a list of examples but there's a lot of different things that they do a lot of little moments that come up and ways that they uh react to the gameplay and stuff that uh really help make it fun like if they had a number of players who you know, weren't that responsive, who weren't that creative or or not even experienced because they weren't very experienced at tabletop role playing when they started, but they were experienced at acting and, and ad libbing mm-hmm. and all and improvising and all this stuff. Um, if they had people that weren't as entertaining as players, the show itself would not be as entertaining. It wouldn't be as fun for everybody. Um, it, yeah, very much so. Uh, I kind of treat Critical Role as like a, just a really good television show, like any mm-hmm. other television show that you enjoy. The players, while they are playing a game and they know it, they are living their game at the same time. They are acting their game, uh, and there's an entertainment value to see that uh, on our ends. You're right, Riles. Um, uh, Matt Mercer has said before he he doesn't like the idea of it. Uh, I'm pretty sure he acknowledges it as a thing uh, because. The, the, the fact of it is, it's not just because he is Matt Mercer as much as it is that he and several other public figures online playing these games are really good at what they do. And so then sometimes other people take their stuff as expectations to other games and they expect them to do it the same way he does it or they expect them to uh, perform at that level. And that can be really hard to live up to for a DM. Um, yeah, I do try to adopt some things from <laughs> some ways that he does things because I see things, not because I think people expect it, but I see some things I go, that's a great idea. I love how he did that. Okay. I'm going to steal that. Um, and there's actually things from other, uh, streaming, uh, game masters that I, that I, I steal or consider stealing from, uh, my wife and I have been watching a newer show called Shikar. And uh, by um, I might I might butcher her name, but Jasmine Buhler, <laughs> um, 
I, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, um, who one of the things I've noticed she kind of does at the start of an episode is she recaps the last episode by making the player re- one of the players recap it by either mm-hmm. having them have kind of a conversation in a dream or like one of the players has a living sword and their the living sword was all like hey no we're going to talk about what just happened and they start going having a whole conversation about it and it's a really <laughs> creative way to kind of recap the last episode without having the you know to sit there and go last time this is what you did blah 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 and i was like five minutes straight yeah yeah i watch some of these things Uh, and go that's a good idea how can i steal that (laughs) yeah uh and you know these people they're professional actors and voice actors uh tv show actors but they're also just gamers at the same time Mm -hmm. and you, you know you and i steal stuff from each other at times uh gm uh, efficiency tips and just ways to do things that are a little different. Uh, and it, that's just gaming. That's yeah. Uh, that's all we're doing. Yeah, we had a conversation not too long ago about uh, cr- town criers and newspapers. Um, we were talking about different ways to kind of drop world story and meta and kind of meta knowledge and stuff onto players and you know you've used like town criers in some of your games and then I have like a newspaper that I'll like type up and, and insert into the game every now and then and stuff. Um, and we haven't necessarily like actively stolen them, but we've talked, sit there and talked no, about it. Yeah. And I go and like, yeah, we could do, you know, you could do that and we could do this. And, um, but the main focus of this is on the players because we, I don't feel like we need to spend too, I do want to talk about DMs a little bit, but I don't feel like, we need to spend that much time talking about DM responsibilities or GM responsibilities. Cause honestly, I mean, that's, that's what kind of made me think about this because that's what people talk about all the time. You know, how the game mm-hmm. master can make the game fun for everybody. And we've talked about it a lot in other episodes. What the GM can do to make sure everyone's having a good time. Right. And I think, there, you know, the DM does have some responsibilities. Uh, you know, establishing, establishing expectations for players. Um, treating people fairly. Uh, focusing on player enjoyment. Um Preparing content and enabling the players to be autonomous, you know, not railroading them. But, as as Riles Plus just said, a single player can ruin it for everybody. One bad player in the group can absolutely destroy a game. Uh, mm. Going back to the CR example, they had an, an mm. issue with this <laughs> in their first yeah. campaign, where uh, he sh- who shall not be named was kicked out of the game. Uh, you know, they had an early player, early on, that they removed from their game because it was not working. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Uh, And not to get into it too much, uh, you know, it, it was a bit of a a setting, not working thing. Like they were friends going into it and played many, many, many months together going into the live stream thing and the live stream itself just wasn't working in that situation. But yeah. And there, there seemed to be some, some personal issues possibly as well that were contributing to that but we're not here to get into all of that um no but the the point is the players are are vital in having a good time if they're not there for each other if they're not there to make sure that each other are having good time the game's gonna suck no matter what the game master does it's a give and take you know uh you and i can prep things for the players uh if they're not reciprocating uh that take back uh, in responding to what we're giving, it kind of doesn't matter. Yeah, so that's what I just kind of want to talk about most of the time is what are the players' responsibilities for making sure that everybody's having a good time? Um, And instead of me just rambling on my crap, I thought I'd go ahead and open it up to you and see if you had some things. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, I think the biggest one for me as a player, because I'm both DM and player, um, when it comes to playing is to try to engage everyone. both at the moment, like in a, in a scene when something's happening, uh, do not just take the, f- the first foot forward and then the next three or four or five feet forward, but to take the first one and then maybe look around and try to gauge reactions from the other players with either words or in this case words because we're not at the table. Um, but I'm going to try to also bring them into the scene if there's a moment where it makes sense to do that and to not, not just give me fully my moment, uh, but a shared mm-hmm. moment. Um, and engaging with them that way, as well as engaging with them in your 
growth as a character. Um, I like to look at the players and be like, okay, well, this is our relationship as a, or as a character. How can I work with that? How can I improve that? Or if I'm not doing enough communication with this character in this group setting, mm -hmm. I should probably find ways to try to connect more with that character and, and interact more with them. Yeah, that's, Definitely sharing play time with other players, you know, not just monopolizing the time. This is something we've talked about on other episodes, you know, sh sharing the spotlight with other people. Uh, even if you can do something or even as the, are the best at doing something, that doesn't mean you always have to do it. Um, but uh, you just mentioned something that's a, that was, a, I thought, a really good thought on that. And I just slipped my mind immediately. It was the last thing you said. <laughs> uh, building connections with yes. the characters to, to bring them in more, to what's going on yes i think that's actually a really good point is and it's something that not necessarily a lot of people do but actively trying to take stuff that is related to your character and share it with people to try to connect them to it to bring them in and that doesn't necessarily work with every character's stuff or like background right. stories like if you have stuff that's really family related it's kind of hard to uh you know necessarily do um but there are still ways you can help to get some of the other players invested uh, and connected into some of that. And I was trying to think of an example of like Crit Roll or something or even our own games. Uh, I have an example uh, that I Go pull for from it. for this ex for my example. Um, uh, we have a character who uh, I don't typically associate with too much, uh, like a lot of communication, uh, who is very shadowy. Um and had some strange like dream visions not too long ago and that's become like a focal point like no one's had that conversation yet like th we just went to the strange house on the strange night because this guy had a dream i'm curious about this now and i'm, I'm attaching to that for this character and bringing that into me as an, an interest point to start having more conversations hmm. uh rouse plus has some has some good points in here um Giving the DM room for error, you know, not being a prick about the rules, trying to rules lawyer the, the GM all the time. I also think healthy boundaries is a good point, you know. Uh, a player that respects other people's boundaries, that is, that cares how mm -hmm. other people are. I think that's kind of a first stepping point period is someone having players that care if other people are enjoying the game, that want everyone to be having fun. And a part of that is that cares what people's boundaries are. You know, they're not going to just spring some uh, weird questionable stuff into the game uh, without kind of making sure that's okay with people. Um, yeah. Or if someone does object to something that they don't think of, you know, being accommodating, being gracious about that instead of pushing. Yeah. Any other ones <laughs> that you have? I, I like trying to, uh, to refocus the spotlight. Like in, in a situation where any of the group could be a spotlight, like it, mm -hmm. it's there's, there's nothing specific towards a single player in the moment in, in the scene to make an attempt to try to refocus it to a specific player, uh, especially some of it's out of character meta, like uh, so and so isn't really talking much this session, you know, let's try to redirect something to them to get them involved, um, or just to have fun with it, uh, just forcing the spotlight on a player so that they're they're if it works they're now the subject of your focus and we get to see how that goes then yeah like uh suddenly making the exhausted and not overly charismatic cleric have to go talk to people <laughs> Yeah, that or like... Uh, Though, admittedly, that was partially because we had a character out in the last session. But I'm like, yeah. hey, can you do this? And you're like, how yeah. about you do this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that or like as a player, from the player perspective, uh, like watching uh, someone paint a masterful thing and everyone like, ooh, who's going to get painted uh, their picture of? And uh, both, in this case, uh, Sarah Feek here, you know, and I both had the same idea of trying to force the in-game spotlight onto the other player and had a little bit of a, a quick roll battle on who won out. Um, and then you get to see how that, you know, takes off after that. Yeah. And that's, and that's an awesome example. Cause that's something where you're, you're like 
almost literally giving a gift to somebody else in a, in a sense because in game there was something very real and this was in my game there was something very real and tangible that was uh kind of collateral like someone was going to win this large magical portrait of themselves and now not all characters would necessarily want that in fact I, I don't think any of you really wanted it but yeah. still <laughs> it's still kind of a cool thing like i've got a cool giant portrait of myself that's kind of cool um and then you're like both trying to be like no they want it um and it turns into this whole comp yeah. short little competition scene to figure out who can persuade uh, the the persuade the performer, the artist, to paint the other person. Uh, while the whole time, y'all have no idea what's going on in my mind, which was just amusing for me because her character very much didn't want it, but ended up kind of actually ensuring that she got it by casting a higher level spell to try to persuade the artist into doing it, not realizing mm -hmm. that the artist normally paints for powerful people and was all like, oh, hello. <laughs> yeah. Well, my, my. Right. And those can <laughs> provide fun moments, especially if they're tangible in-character spotlights and not just a, a forceful like conversation spotlight that you're trying to give another actual player time in that case. Um, yeah. You're making it fun for, I think, the both of you in the case of something like that. And it creates a certain amount of, like, chaos and engagement. You're both engaged with each other now in this kind of competition of sorts that was completely unplanned. At least, I won't say completely unplanned. I had planned for there to be some kind of a, a, a little bit of a contest, but not of that sort, exactly. Um, yeah. And so it really kind of shifted the the course of what, how things were going a little bit. Um. I also uh, I, I have a I have a list of my of my own as well of things. Go for it. Uh, one of which is uh, paying attention. I want to start with some some easy ones. Uh, paying <laughs> attention. Obviously, if players are not paying attention, it is a little hard. Um, you know, if you're, it is a little hard to be really engaged and active uh you know if the players are are doing lots of other things and not paying attention to what is going on in the game period but also not paying attention when other people have their moments because you know sometimes there is a thing where someone's going to have their own play their own character moment you know some character is going to be uh and it is very much harder online than in person. In person, you're all sitting at a table. Very much. Unless someone's yeah. pulling out their phone, they don't really have an option. But online, you're like, well, I could just stealth over here and play a video game. And, <laughs> um, but yeah, but you know, sometimes there are those moments where other players have a moment for their character, where their character's getting rewarded for something or having something happen to them, and nothing. I would say. It's, it's frustrating for me as like a game master when other people are really disconnected and don't seem to care that someone else is having kind of a moment. It's also really hard as a player because you, you already feel a little bit guilty that you're monopolizing some time for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, if no one else is like excited or interested in it at all, it makes you feel kind of stupid. <laughs> You're like, oh, I'm getting real upset about what's happening with my character, and, and no one really seems like they give a crap. Uh, all right, let's move on. It makes it harder for you to enjoy your moment, because now everybody else is like, oh, guy, he's talking to blah, blah, blah. Let me get my phone out. Yeah, it makes it tough to kind of want to keep going, too. Um and it really takes away from the group environment of being, at least like in D&D, &D, uh, a traditional party experience. Yeah, and it's a lot of these tabletop games, I mean, it is definitely a group experience. You know, it's not something that you want people to be solo with all the time or anything, by any means. And that is a responsibility of a good game master, is to keep from focusing too much on just a single person. Uh, but it's also sometimes to have that spotlight focus on you and really go, all right, it's time for all the horrible things from your backstory to come up. <laughs> have fun. Um, another thing that I have is accepting the story. Um, now, and, and by this, I don't necessarily mean that players have to accept plot hooks, you know, 
Mm-hmm. The, the DM is going to put out plot hooks. Some of them you bite on. Some of them you, you don't. Um, but one, you know, adopting, take, taking some of them, sometimes engaging with NPCs and other people, uh, at least being willing to. Uh, for instance, in, in my game recently, uh, the character since left the game, but we have one character that was very much kind of like off and like, I don't really want to do this adventure stuff that everyone else wants to do. But he came up with reasons to go along with it anyway. He's like, but the group wants to do it, so I'm going to go along and do it. Um, he didn't make a real pain of himself about it and drag everybody else to have to do other stuff. Um, right. But also, with that is a little bit of dispelling dis- disbelief on accepting the story. You know, if the if the game master is crafting a story, we're pl- often playing fantasy. It often requires a certain degree of disbelief. And sometimes people do get funny about what they will suspend disbelief on. They're like, oh, you can believe there's dragons and fireballs, but you can't believe that I decided that uh, this tower can float on water. Like, that's that's breaking it for you. Uh, <laughs> um Go with it is what we're saying. Yeah, yeah. Be open uh, to accepting the story. Now, there's obviously some limits for some of that stuff. Um, but try to find a reason <laughs> to yeah. accept it as uh, as canon, or uh, especially you know sometimes sometimes the GM has a reason for like breaking the rules or bending the rules. Um, we've ha- we had an episode about that at one point. Uh, talking about bending those rules as the GM and even, you know, make up enemies that do things that aren't real spells or players can't do or whatever because it's fun and it makes for a better story. Yeah. Uh, And on the the note of kind of paying attention, um, you know, we're talking most about how players can be good players, uh, both with other players, but also towards the GM uh, and, there is so much work that goes into preparing a session every week and every following week and all the pre-prep stuff. And I actually got into a conversation with a friend today who's just asking me, like, how often do you play? How much time do you play each week? Uh, you know, we play four hours every Saturday, 77 episodes or sessions. That's <laughs> so many hours just playing, let alone the prep work for all of that. The worst thing is to be describing something maybe it takes two minutes to describe and to have a player come back be back and like i didn't hear like the last half of that i'm sorry can where are we at and, you know like i don't want to repeat myself because it's going to eat time and we already especially our groups you know we're super rp focused and that eats up time um it, it's just you know it's there, and it's, it bothers me, to, at least as a DM, uh, to that extent. And as a player, I try not to do that in return. Yeah, I mean, we're all, I think we're all guilty of it on occasion. Um, and and sometimes, especially online, there can be a number of things. There's distractions. Uh, there could be technical issues sometimes where, oh, I just didn't hear yeah. <laughs> what, yeah, what one of those words were. Uh, and then, of course, there's, uh, uh, there's also issues um, like... I, I have a very mild hearing impairment now. Um, fortunately, playing online is not normally a problem. With the headphones on and stuff, mm-hmm. it's usually pretty good. But if audio gets scrambled at all, my brain starts making up real weird shit that people says. Like, it makes <laughs> no sense. Um, like, I have this whole story about being at a party and, it, and thinking somebody said something about a dildo bath. And... <laughs> short story they didn't <laughs> but i'm just in there like did they just say something about a dildo bath what even yeah. is that <laughs> and people are like what the hell is wrong with you and i'm like i don't yeah i, I don't know <laughs> to anyone who's just joined we're talking about ro- uh, role playing and table um. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah so uh, but i think often that does come to like a paying attention thing you know you get distracted yeah. or something and you're like oh Can you repeat that? And then, or I I think another form it often comes in as is the um, uh, not really asking to repeat per se, but asking someone to explain something again. Like, you know, uh, I didn't understand. 
exactly what was going on uh, or you mm-hmm. know, like like they do something or no they like you'll start doing something and then they're like i want to do this and you're like oh are you sure you want to do that and they're like i'm like because that guy's not there anymore and he's like oh why not i'm like because i said he moved he over here already Two ago <laughs> yeah or he died um <laughs> which is one reason why like <laughs> episode 24 <laughs> what is a dodo bat um which is one reason why, like, when somebody's dead, I either delete them or I give them a big X yeah. <laughs> yeah. across their icon on the map. Because, yeah. Um, but even and, th- and with that, these... sometimes people are like, I'm going to hit yeah. the dude. I'm like, he's dead. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what you're <laughs> trying to do here. Yeah. And this is largely an online problem more than an at-the-table problem. But it, it is. is a problem. <laughs> It should be the Especially. should be a problem for everyone over the last year and a half. So yeah, exactly. Um, uh, another thing I had was investing in the story. Another player responsibility is, uh, I mean, yeah, attentive engagement. And this is actually something I was getting into with investing in the story. Um, uh, very much is what that means is paying attention, engaging with the story, not just accepting that it's it's real you know accepting suspending disbelief or paying attention to other players but also willfully investing yourself into the story trying to connect to it trying to actually pay a little bit of attention to what things are happening and that could be you know taking notes but not everybody's a note taker um but it can it can involve like taking notes i would say taking notes can also be distracting um it it can be yeah if we know you, someone from Critical Role who <laughs> in the first always camp- like, can you say that one more time? <laughs> yeah, in the first campaign was kind of bad about it. I would say is way better in the second campaign. Like, has seriously got She's that got down now. Yeah. Got, got a system. <laughs> it's down now. But in the first campaign was like, really? You didn't? <laughs> Sometimes. Um, and, but yeah, so, you know, taking notes, uh, but is, is one method, but that's not you know, that's not necessarily a solution in and of itself because I think what's the important thing is caring enough to remember some things. Yeah. It's kind of proactive in character choice making, that proactive going towards the thing of the story or a thing of the story, not mm-hmm. the story itself necessarily, but things about it and proactively leaping towards grabbing hold of some of those anchoring elements. As Rouse just said, uh, you come across a tower floating over the water. How is it floating over the water? I want to know. I want to find out. That looks like an interesting tower. Let me go check that out. Let me go look at yeah. it. These people are over here having a chat in the corner. I'm kind of curious what they're talking about. Um, something interesting and weird was just mentioned by the Game Master. Maybe I should make a note of that and check it out later. Uh, you know, that sort of thing where you're kind of keeping tabs. You're, inve- you're interested in, in the things around the world. Um, but also can be giving back to other players, uh, caring mm-hmm. about when something happens to another player, or kind of the converse of what you said earlier about um, trying to connect other players to your stuff. Other players trying, you know, seeing something happen for somebody else, trying to connect to them, trying to go out, yeah, and be like, oh, uh, you've got this thing going on. Like, do you need help with it, or you know, what can I do? That's... I don't find it very typical to dream about moons and stuff and go out in the middle of the night. Are you okay? <laughs> Are you doing all right? Is, are you sure you're not having a problem? <laughs> um, and, and I think uh, that can come across in, in how you do some of those things as well, too. Like You can be like, of course we're going to do this thing for your character. And that's a little comes a, a that comes across a little differently than really kind of actively taking an interest in it and trying to um, put forward some effort to help them. And as I was another example from CR, uh, I would say one one player that is really trolly but who is really good at this is Sam. Um, <laughs> yes. He he very much in he will take his character and throw him into other people's stuff. Um, Sometimes just to be kind of a jerk and sometimes to really like genuinely engage with them and be like, no, we're going to, we're going to make this a thing and we're going to focus on it. Yeah. Let's see. I lost chat a little bit. They're Um, talking about your legendary door moment. 
Oh god, I have a door moment. I mean, I have a number of them. Everybody has door moments. <laughs> Let's see. My want to be a better D and D player is a major reason for why over the last month I've been trying to alert, improve my ability to focus. Um, have a hell of a time focusing. Yeah, and that is a thing. Like, you know, bearing in mind everybody has limits, and that's why I think you know playing online is a bit of a problem in that regard because it is harder to focus because there's just. There's so much stuff. I mean, like you talk to a lot of writers. A lot of write, professional writers don't write on computers because there's just too much shit. <laughs> there's too mm -hmm. many other things. Yeah, I close the door. Uh, it's just open and close the door. How about hold the door? <laughs> hold the door. Uh, there have been a it's lot of door moments. too soon for her. <laughs> She opened a door recently. It did not go well. No. Uh, both of our characters <laughs> in, in your game, both of our characters now have complexes. We're like, we do not open doors anymore. The, the yeah. other players can open doors. <laughs> we, are, we have had our time. <laughs> we have both nearly died from opening a door. <laughs> and that's, that's a good way also to be a good player is like take your in-game experiences, no matter how... Uh, maybe out of character you're like oh well that that maybe that was rough i wish maybe i didn't take that much damage all at once but then turn it into an in-game new thing that becomes a, a group-wide setting like i'm not touching that door you go first and he's like <laughs> well you know you go f no i'm sorry <laughs> we've been I'm, here <laughs> i'm the wizard we have learned i do not go through doors <laughs> i will look at the door the thing i will examine the door and then i will back way the fuck up <laughs> yeah and every time that conversation comes up, everyone starts to laugh because they remember why. Yeah. And random solutions, as Rouse just mentioned. <laughs> random solutions. Everybody loves it when the GM is flummoxed by something and just like, ah. Sure. All right. <laughs> you just, okay, I didn't think about that. Um. Yeah, we closed the door. We threw a bunch of oil all over the door and the floor, and then we burning hands it when we opened the door again, and all the spiders died. Uh, <laughs> but uh, investing in the story um, is also, um, you know, being excited for things that happen to other people's characters, being excited for things that happen to your character, you know, uh, allowing yourself to get emotionally invested in the game. Uh, and not everyone can do that as well. Uh, not everyone necessarily has to be amazing at it. Just, you know, trying to be open to being emotionally invested in the game and the character and stuff. Uh, I get way more emotionally invested in my tabletop characters than I do in real life because I am not a terribly emotional person. Um, but I know the feeling. <laughs> you hurt my character. I'm like, why are you doing that? why are you mean to him um my last thing on that on investing in the story is to not be antagonistic or pissy just because things aren't going your way yeah which can be hard because the dice are pricks sometimes it's frustrating as a player um i mean i i, I don't i don't think you watch the whole thing but uh I, we had a recent Zweihander session on Tabletop to Keyboards channel where we had a fight, our whole group, against some crappy guards. Like, you know, standard crappy town guards. We're like ultra high tier characters. And these are some crappy standard t gu town guards that we're supposed to be fighting. And they were beating the ever living crap out of us purely because of the dice rolls. We just kept rolling horribly. We could not hit yeah. them. And, I mean, everybody was getting frustrated. I was actively, like, combating my frustration by just being amused at what was happening. Like, this is some Benny Hill shit. I'm just like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm still irritated, but on the surface, I'm at least just like... <laughs> you, yeah. You can, you either laugh at this or you're going to be mad. And I, I'm choosing to laugh at it. It's usually like one player in a session or, you know, sporadically just has a really bad night. Uh, it's rare to see everyone have a bad night. It does make good story. 
Yeah, failures failures are good. And sometimes that's the thing. Sometimes the GM intends for you to fail. It, and now the GM has to be careful with that because uh, nobody yes, likes <laughs> to fail. Um, nobody likes to have to run away, especially in D&D where there's this kind of assumption that you're usually going to be successful. Um, but, you know, give... And this kind of goes, I think, with back with suspending disbelief, um, accepting the story. Except that sometimes the story necessitates that something bad happens to you. Um, and the DM... May may even force that to happen. They may th throw it in. You're like, wait, don't I get a saving throw for that? And they're like, no. And you can either be really pissy about it, or you can accept it and go, oh my god, what's going to happen to my character? Yeah, uh, rather, and roll with yeah, it. I, and that's a mental player thing. Is you have to be able to, if you want to have fun, you have to take it in stride and let it, let it play out. And if at the end of it, it played out very poorly, then, you know, come back and be like, have a private conversation. Like, that did that just didn't turn out cool. I had no fun with that. But give them at least a chance to, like, there's a reason why yeah. I'm doing this forcefully, you know, moment thing for you. It's for you, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, and I, and I wouldn't generally be that heavy-handed with it as, like, a GM. Yeah. Um, but there are some you cases where I could see fun. it. Like, if you really want... If you wanted the... You know, if you wanted a, to end a campaign on a sad note where someone has to die or something, uh, I mean, yeah, you can maybe be heavy-handed with it there. Uh, the game's ending Kill anyway. Them. You're going to run up the all. drama or something. Uh, yeah, you definitely don't ever. It was just a dream. Uh, <laughs> um, unless it's like a little a little session or something. That's okay. Like a, It's a you, dream, you but have, it was a premonition of the first session, like right before the first session, and you have to start yeah. the whole campaign over again, knowing what can happen and make all new different choices. Yeah, that's a trope. <laughs> that's a trope. We I don't think we've ever used, but it's still uh, fun to think about. Yeah, yeah. Epic foreshadowing. Um, but that's that's something though. Like accepting that and rolling with it is one of the examples of why I think the players in like show some of the shows like Critical Role are so great and really make the show because they do not argue with much of anything that Matt Mercer does. Very little. Uh, yeah. They unless he unless they're really trying to clarify a rule or something like he could straight up be like I'm knifing you and you die and they're just like Oh my God I'm dead What happened to my character I'm freaking yeah. out now and they just it's accept it and they go with it and they have they try to have fun with it and um, at the very minimum there's a little like. Uh, you know like this and this and this a, a little just questioning and then yeah and that's fine you know matt says matt has a reason for it and they're going okay okay you know yeah yep let's, let's cool do it. <laughs> let's go for it um and that that's that comes down to trust which is something that not all yeah. groups have in that in that level uh you and a, and a gm has to kind of earn that to some degree you know they have to work at earning that level of trust from the players um you will make mistakes and, and lose it, and then you have to regain it. Yeah, which brings me to my last one. I don't know if you have any more, but brings me to my last one here, which is player on playing honestly as the last uh, responsibility I have for players. It's a good one. It's a good um, one. I mean, the most blatant thing of this is cheating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't do that. Um, I agree that there definitely needs to be trust, not just amongst players, players and the GM. Yeah, um, and, and that's that's a thing. Like, you know, do you require dice rolls to be on camera? Do you use an electronic rolling system? Um, how much do you control or oversee people's control of their character sheets? Like, I I will freely admit, I never check what people's hit points are on the sheets. People could be adding hit points. They could be changing all kinds of stuff. I have no idea. I don't check your spell slots. I don't check your hit points. I assume you're playing honestly. Good faith. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that you're going to do that. But there's other, there's other areas for that. Um, there's metagame meta knowledge. Gaming. Yeah. Uh, not... We're all sometimes guilty, I think, of metagame knowledge. And I I still argue that some types of metagaming... Are okay. Are okay. Uh, I agree. 
for instance, we recently had a conversation about, um, or, or rather, I had suggested to my D and D group because my Zweihander group did this that I was like, you know, if y'all wanted to have a private Discord channel that did not have me in it, where you could talk about the game and talk about like strategy and stuff, like how you want to face a battle or something, yada yada yada, and and where I'm not in it, so I can't see what your strategy is going to be, I'm okay with that. Go, go for it. It's kind of metagaming because you could do that in the middle of a fight and you could be like, hey, I think you should do this. But I don't care. <laughs> That's not the sort of metagaming it I is, really care about, honestly. But only up to like the first turn and only up to like some of it shifts like roll initiative and suddenly it's like, okay, well, there goes my plan. I'm last. Uh, chances are I have to come up with something on the spot anyway. Yeah, you know, probably. So, well, it's metagaming, but it, it's so fluid anyway that that meta changes halfway through initiative, you know? Yeah. The only time I have a problem with people kind of metagaming combat and being like, Hey, you, you know, what would be really good here. If you did this or blah, blah, blah is when they're kind of pressuring people to do things they don't want to do. Now that I do have a problem with, like, yeah, I'm like, do, do what you want to do with your character. Don't do what everybody else wants you to do. Um, the the meta game kind of strategizing itself. I, I don't care. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know. And typically for from players, like usually if we're if I say we uh, we all probably do it sometimes. Uh, in those moments, we're like, hey, you should maybe do this. Is is usually because it benefits myself or something. You know, like if you don't do this, I'm gonna die, and I don't want to die. So you know, uh, yeah. I'll just let it be. And if there if there's a confusion as to what to do. Uh, you know, give aid in a different way somehow to to clarify the confusion. But yeah, and sometimes sometimes meta gaming like that can detract from the drama of the game. Like uh, yeah, we both use private death saves for five e. Yes, um, we, we get do. players to tell us privately whether they s passed or, s or failed a death save because we don't want the other players to know because it increases the drama if they know that they've succeeded on their death save and they still have three they can make then they're not that worried about running yeah. over there and healing them yeah. they're like eh, they got two more which is metagame knowledge that they shouldn't have yeah. i'll give it a round i'll give it a round she'll be fine you know and then yeah. then heal i would do another you fireball real quick <laughs> uh so yeah we hide it we're like no you, you don't know you don't know and if you went at behind the scenes it was like hey everybody i've got two death saves left that would ruin that um that yeah. i would not like i bet um, I've been there uh, with one left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Also, that's one. Yeah. Coming across enemies, you know, the moves of that's the thing. A lot of us like D and D veterans and stuff. We know most of the resistances or have good ideas of what they are mm -hmm. for creatures. And so it can be hard to suspend that when you're playing. That's where, uh, you, as a player, you you ask if there's a moment to ask where it makes sense to ask. Like, a lot of times you'll hear, do I know what this creature is? Um, either mid-fight or, like, right as you're going into it, just so that you can get the that fulfillment of being like, oh, I know, okay, I can do all this other stuff then. Um, otherwise, assume on your first turn, you know, especially if it's combat, that you don't know and just go with your character flow yeah well and that's one of the things like that i love to use intelligence based skills for those because um, mm -hmm. it helps to add value to them a lot you know a lot of, one of the problems with D, D is that intelligence itself is kind of a shitty stat um unless you're a wizard or or an artificer intelligence sucks uh, most of the intelligence based skills don't do anything practical um they're really mostly rp fluff Unle except like investigate investigates good um but for the most part they're kind of eh. um yeah so i like to use them for that and be like okay you know get in a fight with something someone's like do i know what this thing is and i'm like all right roll me uh what is this elemental roll me a nature or an arcana check whichever one you want and then depending on your role i might tell you what some of the resistances are i might tell you you know, if you you have to get pretty high for me to really start going into details like that, uh, or if your character has a reason they would know. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, um, yeah. suspending well, a fire that elemental. 
you're pretty sure it's probably <laughs> not gonna, you know, care if you hit it with fire. Yeah, that one's pretty, pretty sure. easy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can assume common sense wise that that's the case, uh, unless your wisdom is below like twelve, in which case, <laughs> maybe fire. You can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fireball it. Um, That'll kill it for sure. But yeah, like I actively, you know, because I DM. I have to. You'll pull out like a monster, and sometimes, and depending on what it is. Uh, now that we're higher level, it's less often the case. Uh, but you know, you pull out a monster at lower levels, especially. I'm like, oh, I'm pretty sure they're resistant to this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then, like, my character's a necromancer, so if it's undead, I feel a little bit better going, like, do I know if it's resistant to necrotic damage? Because, I mean, I am a necromancer. <laughs> Which, surprisingly, and we've said it many times, most of them are not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and fortunately, it's kind of a, a mixed blessing in some degree, because, because because I'm experienced with so many different editions of D&D, I get I, I get confused between the different editions and I can't remember what is the case anyway. Sometimes I'm like, uh, are zombies immune to? Yeah. God, well, okay, Poison? maybe that yes. was third edition. Necrotic? No, <laughs> I don't remember. Um, but yeah, another uh, another thing I'm playing honestly that's really hard. I think is uh, loss of alignment or control with your character. Um. We've we've talked about this a little bit on and off, you know, things like being charmed, being mind controlled, mm-hmm. uh, all of that. It's it's sticky situation type stuff with the with the as a as a GM because no one likes losing control of their character, um, and it's one of the areas I think you see the most where players are very reluctant to lean into it <laughs> because they don't want to kill all their party members and they're like. Yeah. Um, like a lot of people will start going, okay, so what did they tell me to do exactly? Oh, the, the succubus told me to go and uh, everybody. The, the succubus told me to protect her. So I'm going to stand in front of her and just block the path to her. Even though these people are shooting her from range, I'm going to stand back here and just block them so they can't get to her. And then you have some people like me who are just like, oh no, I'm mind controlled. Uh, let's see, do I have fireball prepared? Nope. No, you're lucky. I don't have fireball prepared. Uh, but yeah. I do have a level four yeah. spell slot, so this is going to hurt anyway. <laughs> very, very relevant. I like that. Uh, uh, it's not a bad thing uh, for players, like for the other players to see controlled, said controlled player come after them. Um, it's something that will create possibly story down the road, like shortly after the fight. Uh some conversation uh it builds interesting conversation i think really yeah and it's a it's a difficult thing as a player to uh for some people i will say to lean into uh i'm kind of like giddy like oh no i get to like like fireball my own teammates this is awesome let's go (laughs) this is not my fault it's the gm's fault they're the one that mind controlled me i'm sorry people don't blame me yeah (laughs) Don't blame me. He, the GM said kill them all, and I have a fireball ready. So what do you expect me to do? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not over here smiling at all, I promise. As a GM, I'm like, I, none of my guys have fireball. Ooh, but you do. Let's see if we can uh, turn that into my favor. <laughs> they were very lucky I did not have any good combat spells prepared for that fight. <laughs> like damaging spells. Um, anywho. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. um that was the la- that was really the last player responsibility i had uh prepped for did you have anything or does chat have anything they want to throw out uh down last few minutes it, here downtime uh i feel this is relevant in some cases uh it happens regardless what system you're in uh there's usually some form of downtime uh sometimes you take breaks from playing and mm-hmm. You say, okay, you know, we're going to, you know, we're not playing next week. We're going to say, given where the story is at, you guys have two weeks of downtime in character to do what you guys want to do. Come up with things you'd like to do. Part of your responsibility as a player is to come up with things you'd like to do. Uh, to actually utilize that time to invest into yourself. It's probably the best thing you can do is to invest into yourself. In have those a character moments. that's interesting enough to have things to do during downtime. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and... And that's important too. Is consider 
either at the very beginning or as the game is going, like, what are some things that I can start to do that are interesting to my character? Uh, but utilize that time for yourself, I think, more importantly. You can do things with other players, but that's literally the best moment to do you stuff because uh, it's not eating time from anyone else. Yeah, and one thing that we don't do too often but is good, I think, is maybe starting that with starting those off with even saying like hey does anyone need help on anything during downtime you need somebody to go with you for something or yada 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 to yeah you know whatever the case may be um to kind of help because i think one of the things with downtime is getting the ball rolling because you'll be like all right we're not gonna we're gonna have like two weeks of downtime but if you play every week that means you have one week to figure out what your character did for two weeks and some yeah. people wait four days to do that instead of picking it up like the next day and going, all right, I'm going to do this and this and this, or does anybody want to help me on this and getting, some, taking some initiative on that. I will usually message you like the night of. <laughs> yeah. You're, but you're really quick on that. I usually have a list. I have a running list, like almost at all times of downtime stuff. It's actually almost empty now. Like we have almost exhausted it. I, um, <laughs> at least at Three least of more. stuff I can do during like a one week period or something. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but my pet peeve is if you are given time in the week to come up with things, take it and don't wait till the beginning of the next session to fulfill those things. Yeah. And play them in <laughs> through the course of now starting your, your game. Uh, Cause you had all the time to do so before you're going to irritate probably everyone at the table. But I think that kind of goes into in general, don't eat up a bunch of play time with stuff that yeah. you could have done with other stuff or that is not related to anything or other people mm -hmm. like taking the first half hour of a live gameplay session to recap what you wanted to do during downtime. Yeah. Um, Cause while well, everyone else is like, yeah, we just emailed the DM during the week. Uh, <laughs> Cause you're, you're eating in everybody else's experience at this point. Yeah. Let's see. Is Zany shenanigans appropriate downtime character stuff? Yeah, depending. Sure. Absolutely. Sure uh, when I give people downtime, I, I don't care what they spend it on. I'm like, as long as you can fit it in the week, if it's something important to you, send it to me. I will reply back and, and tell you what to do. And depending on what it is, I might be like, make me a check or I write you up a summary or something. But it could even be, hey, let's, if you have time, let's do email back and forth RP to give because it seems like it might need more attention um to really build something or yeah, sometimes but, yeah personate a cleric of pay law yeah all right well i think that's pretty much it um thanks for coming out everybody uh for hanging out at episode 23 mask and mimicry we've done 23 of these mostly in a row uh we're probably mostly. gonna take a little bit of a break for like a couple weeks or so um come up with some new new episodes and stuff we have a bunch in a list but you know uh we haven't had a really a break at any point yet so we might do one of those for uh coming up um i do have my usual stream friday and sunday friday at 6 p.m pacific time playing subnautica and below zero and sunday at 4 p.m um i may Managed to build in some random streams. I don't know if I'll be if I'll manage to get on one tonight. If I do, it'll probably be really late. Um, I've been trying to pack in some more random stream times during the week to uh, get through that. Subnautica. Um, like every night in a row, he's streaming. What? What is this? What's well, this past weekend, I did. <laughs> I did get several of them in. Uh, but this, but because this week I've been packed, I had stuff Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday's my stream. So I was like, I don't know when I'm gonna do anymore uh but you can sub you can follow the channel and get notifications don't it's don't fun. forget for twitch you have to toggle and tell it to give you notifications um but anyway uh so we got those coming up uh in two weeks next not this sunday but next sunday i'll be on tabletop to keyboards channel again that's twitch.tv slash tt2kb uh playing as y hander um until then I uh, hope everybody uh, has a good night. And remember, if it's a notebook, it's probably not a mimic. Good night, everybody. <laughs>